I want to welcome everybody to the uh, first meeting of the new Brown Bag Seminar here at the Mises Institute. Uh, I guess I know everybody here, but I'm Mark Thornton at the Mises Institute. And uh, the Brown Bag Seminar is something that we had in operation a number of years ago. Uh, in, I think it was November of 1996, uh, Governor Fob James uh, made a presentation at the Brown Bag Seminar when we had it in the College of Business on the merits of the gold standard. A very nice presentation and um, one thing led to another and he hired me to work for the governor's office in Montgomery and so the brown bag shut down. It was a little better than that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long story. Um, the governor's sitting there saying you know, there was some guy who ran for office that was talking about this stuff. I can't remember what his name was. Mark something. <laughs> Mark turns and says, welcome to my seminar. <laughs> and that's on tape someplace. <laughs> but in any case, um, I'm back, have been for a while, and uh, we thought it would be a good idea to restart the Brown Bag Seminar and to uh, once again grow it into... Uh, an event uh, as good or better than it was um, back in the 1990s. So the governor's coming next week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this governor in the Well, you never know. You hear about smoking? <laughs> yeah, and actually our, our next speaker is going to be Richard Alt uh, next week on uh, what the government doesn't want you to know about tobacco. And then the last... Uh, seminar in January is going to be given by Henry Thompson um, on Croatia in trans transformation. What is transition. It? transition? The economy in transition over there, um, along with a little photo tour, hopefully of of his travels over there. So, um, one thing I'd like you to do is to think about making. A presentation yourself here at this seminar or to suggest others and to invite other people from around Auburn and Lee County and, and as well as of course the university students and faculty who you think might be uh, interested in attending I have a feeling it's going to be a, a great seminar now my talk today is going to be on the subject of do we need higher taxes in the state of Alabama and when we planned this out, there wasn't, this wasn't really an issue in the state of Alabama, but um, fortunately the, uh, the state legislature um, makes my job a lot easier. In the paper last week, um, House Speaker says new taxes needed. And uh, I thought, you know, this is a godsend for me as far as giving my talk. It's, it's actually quite a threat to the people of Alabama. Uh, but then I started looking at the page in general, and I thought to myself, well, here's right here we have the private sector, Belk, price breaks, 50 to 60 percent off everything in the store. Same thing down here with Curry's, um, women's clothing, winter clearance, 40 to 60 percent, everything off. And then up in this corner, we have an article about the Salvation Army, and it's the Salvation Army is collecting more money than ever in Alabama, primarily to help the victims uh, of the hurricane in southern Alabama. As a matter of fact, they were even using, they didn't have enough uh, people to go around collecting all the money, so they came up with cardboard cutouts of people in Salvation Army uniforms and they apparently were collecting just tons of money and then again in this corner um, the government needs more taxes it's going to do less and require more whereas the private sector and the charity sector is doing more with less so I think it was a sort of a good uh, sort of window on society right on that one page of the uh, of the newspaper <coughs> Now, there are two views of taxes in my many travels and discussions with people. The first view is that uh, taxes are too low, and the other view is that taxes are too high. 
these are just people's opinions. Um, but the, the group that thinks taxes are too low are generally people who consume taxes. These are people who, you know, work for government, who are bureaucrats who, who are on some form of government welfare or on the public dole in some form or another. The people who think taxes are too high are basically the people who are, the people who are paying the taxes. The employees, the entrepreneurs, the savers, the investors, and so forth. Um, and so you have these basic two groups. In Alabama, the group calling for higher taxes has been beating the drum for higher taxes loud and often uh, for many, many years, at least the 20 years that I've been in this state. We've had several efforts at what's called tax reform. We've had constitutional reform, which was another way of saying more taxes. We've had uh, the effort to establish a state lottery that would bring in essentially more revenue, more layers of tax reform, and most recently, Amendment 2 to the Constitution, which ultimately went down to defeat, um, which was a really an underhanded way of providing leverage so that uh, lawsuits could be brought against public education in Alabama, which would essentially allow judges to force the state to raise taxes in order to provide more money to education. And I know uh, the person who wrote the bill uh, was somebody I worked with in the governor's office, and uh, the basic bill that he wrote would essentially have removed all of the racist um, language as well as a lot of uh, things that have become redundant in the Constitution. So it would have made it smaller, uh, the Constitution, and it would have taken out all the racist language. And two legislators at the last minute did a little editing on the document in order to, again, provide that way of, that backhanded way of the state race. I'm not sure. There was one in the Senate and one in the House. A little after the meeting, editing to the document. The claim of the advocates for higher taxes in Alabama is that Alabama does not provide enough government services. Uh, in particular, that it doesn't fund public education enough. And that's really one of the uh, main emphasis of the state. I was talking earlier that if we eliminated public education and we eliminated all of federal programs that the state runs that are mandated by the federal government, state government would almost disappear. One of the uh, particular emphasis of this group is that Alabama has the lowest property taxes in the nation and is that result of these low property taxes, overall tax revenues are too low and thus government services like public schools are underfunded um, and that this is a tragedy for the people of Alabama. Now, property taxes are indeed low in the state of Alabama, with some calculations placing Alabama as number one in terms of low property taxes. However, this does not mean that taxes are too low or that state government is too small. And so I did a study uh, originally for the governor, but I've got some updated uh, figures here today about taxes, spending, and the size of government. And basically what I did was I compared Alabama to its neighbors, Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, and Mississippi. And I thought that this was a better comparison because these are states with similar economies, with similar demographic groupings, um, with the same basic problems and the same basic resources, and we're also competing for things like new industries and new jobs and so forth, so that by comparing our neighbors rather than the whole nation, where you have a lot of different states uh, with different problems, different resources, different economic climates, I thought that this was a much better comparison. And to compare Alabama to California or Rhode Island just didn't make any sense to me. If we look at state taxes, this is the first slide I'll show you. Um, basically what we have here uh, on this chart is the state of Alabama from 92 to 96. The figure is 
$1,144.10. That's the amount of taxes that is paid in the state of Alabama to the state government per person. And then if we look at the state average of the surrounding states, we see that the, our neighboring states uh, raised more taxes than in Alabama, um, so that Alabama's, Alabamians only pay 95 cents compared to every dollar that our neighbors are paying. And then when I looked at some updated figures, 97 to 99, of course, taxes are going up quite a bit, so it's not like we're receiving less revenue, uh, but taxes are also going up um, for our neighbors so that actually Alabama is becoming an even lower tax state. Uh, and tax revenues to the state of Alabama in 2002 were $1,453. So you're talking you know, a constant and pretty significant increase in revenue streams. How does the Education Trust Fund fit into that? Do the other states have something similar? I mean, some of that isn't even subject to tax increases, right? Because of what was set up from the royalties from the offshore, offshore gas, all that sort of stuff. Well, that's right. We have that. That's a, an additional revenue uh, stream to the. But is that included in that? Well, it's not included in that. Okay. So, well, that but explain. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's where we're going to go to um, in terms of looking at, you know, what are our actual revenues, what are our actual expenditures. Um, the first indication when we're looking at just sales tax, income tax, excise tax, is that Alabama is a low tax state. State revenues. Same basic comparison, you see that uh, the figure increases for Alabama to $1,659, whereas our neighbors now are $1,509. Okay, so this is including additional revenue streams that, the, uh, that Alabama <coughs> gets. Um, and this is, a, this is a good measure of revenue in the sense that this is the measure of money that the state has that it can really manipulate, that it really determines itself. Um, it includes things like user fees and revenues from other state operations. So these are basically sorts of business operations that the state is uh, conducting, uh, such as uh, ABC, the Alabama Beverage, uh, Alcohol Beverage Control uh, Group. And you can also see that revenues are increasing at a pretty good pace. Uh, we're still above the four state average. And um, in 2002, revenues per capita were $2,168. So again, that flow of funds is increasing in excess of inflation uh, as measured by CPI uh, over this time period. It doesn't stop there. There's other ways of measuring what they do down in Montgomery. This is general revenues. Again, the figures are jumping um, into higher levels. Uh, Alabama receiving 7% more than the region here. And in 99, it's 5% more. Um, in 2002, uh, Alabama's general revenues were $3,569, so there's a big jump in uh, the amount of the amount of general uh, revenue. And this category adds things like intergovernmental transfers, so money from uh, the, the federal, local, and county levels. However, that flows. Um, the state is getting a uh, net benefit from that, and uh, their general revenues as a result um, are substantial, they're increasing, and they're greater than the, the surrounding area. And then we have total revenues. This is government accounting where you can have multiple things meaning, you know, seemingly the same, uh, but uh, misleading in many cases. This is the broadest measure of government. Um, 
this category includes all the other categories and also revenues from public utility and insurance trust funds. Okay, so this is money that is siphoned off um, from public utilities and the insurance trust fund. Uh, once again, Alabama <clears throat> is above the regional average. Um, Alabama is second highest in terms of total revenues only to Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi has the quote unquote benefit of getting huge amounts of money from the federal government. Uh, it hasn't seemed to help over the last 50 years, but they get that money uh, nonetheless. And then finally, keep all this correct here, total expenditures per capita. It's the spending side of, of government. Um, Alabama is above the regional average in terms of spending by 8%. Uh, again, that's uh, pretty significant. And in 2002, total spending per capita by the state was $4,017. So for every man, woman, and child in the state of Alabama, the state government is spending over $4,000. And that was 2002. So it's, you can estimate in your head that it's going to be probably somewhere between 5 and 10% greater than that figure today. So basically what I found is that when you go through all the facts and the figures, that we compare ourselves to the states that surround us, the states are, that are most like us in terms of economy and population and all the other factors that I looked at, um, that Alabama state government is larger than the regional average, that in many categories it's the largest uh, spender or uh, the largest government as measured by these uh, different categories and the only time they're ever actually beat out is when Mississippi is brought into the picture and we look at the money that is coming in from the federal government into the state of Mississippi so you know that's the um, the one thing in which Alabama is not the actual largest state government in the region and of course Mississippi they get all that federal money and they also have um, what economists view as the fixed cost of government. Um, it's a smaller state, a smaller population, and, uh, and so you have, you know, every state has a governor, for example. So that the governor's salary, as a percentage of Mississippi's GDP, is going to be much larger than the governor's salary in New York as a percentage of GDP. Uh, so what we have is, uh, is a situation that the facts point out that Alabama does not have too small of a government. And that, interestingly, it seems like the more government a state has, the poorer it is. Because the states with the lowest uh, government per capita, Tennessee, Georgia, and Florida, are actually some of the leading economies in the southeastern region. Now, our brand of economics here, Austrian economics, would argue that more government does actually hurt the economy and that less government helps the economy. Therefore, it should not be surprising uh, that these results um, have been found. Additionally, uh, you know, one of the main issues in state governments, especially in Alabama, is education. Alabama spends the largest percentage of its budget on education compared to any state in the region. One other thing that I found in uh, doing this little uh, research for the governor's office was a particular area of problem, and that was that the state spends a lot of its resources, and I guess I don't have this transparency here with me, um, a lot of its resources on labor and very little of it on capital. As a matter of fact, when you look at the national statistics, Alabama state government is one of the highest spenders in terms of its labor bill, wages and benefits, versus its expenditure on capital goods. You know, building roads, building bridges, uh, buying trucks, buying computers. 
And economics in general <clears throat> shows that when labor has a small amount of capital to work with, it has poor machinery, it has poor technology, it has poor infrastructure, that you're going to get very low productivity. And that's basically what we have in the state is we're spending a lot of money on labor, very little on capital, and so the capital labor ratio is very small, and so what you get is a large labor bill and very little productivity out of it. <clears throat> to point this out in terms of public education, over the last 30 years in Alabama, enrollment in public schools, in terms of the number of students, has fallen by 15%. 30 years? Over 30 years, we've had a 15% decrease in the number of students. Now, if you live in Auburn, you think, well, we're building schools, we have more students, and so forth. But over the entire state, um, total enrollment has fallen by 15% in public schools. In public schools. Uh, and the ratio between public and private hasn't changed that much. The homeschool is in increasing, but if you add homeschooling and private schools, uh, their growth relative to public schools doesn't really change that much. Just a couple of percentage points. Uh, although I did find that surprising. What's even more surprising is that labor in public schools, the number of people we have working for public schools over that same 30-year period has increased 40%. So you have 15% fewer students, 40% more teachers, administrators, and bureaucrats, and the, um, the percentage of those in administration, non-teaching positions, has accounted for the vast bulk of that 40% increase. Pay is also up. Alabama is now above the regional average for teacher pay and almost at the national average. The net result is that if we look at the cost of educating a child in the state of Alabama, adjusted for inflation, the cost has increased over that 30-year period by 150%. How about the returns to this massive increase in expenditures? Well, there's a lot of debate over whether or not students are receiving a better or worse education now than 30 years ago. There's a lot of uh, statistics. There's a lot of test scores. There's a lot of opinions on all that. <clears throat> in my own experience as a college instructor at Auburn and elsewhere, um, I found that there was a rather significant decline in the quality and training and ability of students in terms of basic things like writing, spelling, basic math skills like adding, dividing, ratios, percentages, and in basic conceptual thinking. And I've asked colleagues, former colleagues, about all this to see if it wasn't just me if it wasn't just my own frustrations or if it was a more general problem. They noted that, for example, history, the students' understanding and knowledge of history uh, has declined uh, significantly. American history, European history, uh, things of that nature, although almost all students know everything they need to know about dinosaurs and any other extinct species. Most students will know, for example, that Thomas Jefferson was a slaveholder, uh, but very few will know that he was the author of the Declaration of Independence. So, and also there's been a noted trend for college textbooks to continually be dumbed down edition after edition. This is, again, something in Austrian economics that we shouldn't find surprising, the public sector uh, versus the private sector. The basic reason for the failure of public schools is that private schools are consumer-driven where public schools are not. They are insulated from the consumer. They are insulated from competition. 
one of our students here, um, Barry Simpson, uh, in his dissertation pointed out, he looked at um, compulsory education laws in the United States, laws that were passed in the previous century to mandate that everybody should attend schools, whether it's public or private. And he noted that long before the public school movement got started and compulsory attendance laws were enforced, that in, for example, the state of Massachusetts in 1850, that literacy was already at 98%, and that today it is barely above 92%. Schools also spend a lot of time brainwashing, brainwashing children about the benefits of public schools, government programs, and environmentalism, and how wonderful they are. Where entrepreneurs, on the other hand, corporations, and the wealthy are inherently evil. This they seem to be doing a good job with. They actually seem to be doing a very good job at that. On the other hand, if we look at private schools, and in particular homeschoolers, we see that they are the hottest thing in education today. Homeschooled children beat private school children in testing scores, and they leave public school children uh, basically in the dust as far as all that's concerned. And one of the most important things I think that Austrian economics points out, as well as the statistics, is that money cannot really solve this problem. And so, you know, I would like to think that we could go back to a system of, of private schools, but the first point um, of defense on all this is that more money does not solve this problem. The U.S. spends $500 billion a year on public education. That's a lot of money. Internationally, the U.S. is second only to Switzerland in the amount of money spent on public schools relative to their income. So if you look at their ability to pay, Switzerland pays the most for public education. The United States is a close second. And yet our students in international testing rank only 18th out of 21 nations participating. On our own test, the National Assessment of Educational Pro Progress, less than one quarter of our 12th graders are proficient in both math and science. So only 25% are rated as proficient at graduation. What can we do about public schools? besides just eliminating them. Well, the best thing to do would be to remove all federal and state involvement in public education. One of our big problems in the state of Alabama is that every dollar goes to Montgomery and then comes back to the local districts, and a lot of that gets siphoned off and regulated away. If we eliminated both the federal and state government and all money was raised for public schools at the local level, and spent at the local level and decided at the local level um, public schools would perform better. The current trend is for school districts to become larger, school boards to become smaller, and classrooms to become smaller. I think that smaller classrooms somehow result in higher education or better education. Actually, the trend should be almost reversed, where school districts become smaller, education boards become larger so that more people can have a say-so, and that classrooms can actually become larger. Teachers are the most expensive part of education, and uh, if you have more students in a classroom, you can do it more um, cost-effectively. These type of local public schools, I think, would drive the following reforms. Increase the percentage of classroom teachers in the school workforce from its current level at 50%. So only 50% of school employees are teachers to 90%. Increase the, and that's the way it used to be. I mean, if you go back 50 or 75 years, you'll find that um, under those circumstances, 90% of school employees were teachers. Well, 
Yeah, that's a big increase. Alabama actually has um, one of the highest credentialed um, teaching forces in the nation. We have a huge percentage of our teachers have graduate degrees. I told Rotary Guard High School I would go teach or, you know, high school economics class. If they had to pay me something, pay me a dollar. No, they couldn't do it. So, I mean, I drive to Greenville to teach high school students in this private school. They don't care. Yeah. So imagine if you could allow talented people in the classroom that are being boxed out now. And how many of those graduate degrees are degrees in education? As oh. opposed to, yeah, economics or chemistry, et cetera. Et cetera. Entirely. I mean, I think the figure is 99% are all graduate degrees in education. Uh, we'd also want to see an increase in the percentage of instruction time during the day and a reduction in extracurricular activities. We'd also like to see um, an increase in grading standards for students, uh, the removal of non-performing students, just kidding, <laughs> and from the classroom. Institute effective performance review of teachers, preferably parent-driven, restore tenure to its original conception, and provide competitive salaries for teachers. Note that all of these type of reforms um, have been found when used to increase student achievement. In other words, these things have actually worked. And the other nice part about all those type of reforms is that they don't require any new resources uh, to achieve that kind of thing. And that's very important. Um, not only does money not work, as I think I've shown, but also raising taxes uh, has a detrimental effect on the economy. Every time we raise a dollar in taxes, we uh, put a much larger cost onto the economy. Not only does that dollar come out of the private sector, but you also discourage um, the economy by, by putting those taxes on the economy. And as a result, we have fewer resources for addressing all of our state's needs, both public and private. One of the most shocking things that um, I think that I found when doing this research is, you know, What's behind all this? Who's, um, who's at fault here? Um, one of the things that I was most shocked about is um, the views of economists on all of these issues about taxes and spending and um, government involvement in the economy. I would have thought that they would have been sympathetic to things like deregulation and things like uh, privatization and would not be sympathetic towards greater taxes. Uh, but what I found from surveys is that this is not the case. And I guess I shouldn't have been that surprised because most government, excuse me, most economists work for government. In a survey of economists and the general public, for example, when asked are taxes too high, economists said no, the general public over overwhelmingly said yes. Uh, when asked, are big deficits a problem? The general public thought it was a major problem. Economists only considered it a minor problem. Is government spending on things like foreign aid, war, and foreign expenditures a big problem? The general public considered it a major problem. Uh, economists didn't consider it a problem at all. Uh, in terms of welfare spending, the general public thought it was a bad thing. Uh, economists thought we didn't spend enough. And, of course, this is a, just a general survey of a sample of economists, but nationwide. nationwide. Yeah. And in terms of government regulation, the general public thought it was a major problem. The economists thought it was a minor problem with specific difficulties. Uh, when asked about tax cuts, the general public thought, in general, that it was a good thing, but economists were basically indifferent on that issue. It didn't make much of a difference. Um, asked about bureaucratic trade agreements like NAFTA and GATT, all that kind of thing, uh, the general public said that, yes, this did have some problems, uh, where economists thought 
it was unambiguously a good thing. So, you know, in terms of advocating uh, policy change and policy reform, I'm afraid that uh, the e economics profession in general uh, really doesn't provide much support for some of the arguments that I've made here today, which are that Alabama is not a low-tax state, that the, the state of Alabama's government is actually quite large compared to the rest of the region, and that the problems in state government in Alabama can be fairly easily identified, and that is that we spend way too much on labor, and that in terms of education, that problem is very um, well identified, and that there are some uh, readily available, uh, readily adaptable solutions to the problems of public education in the state of Alabama, which would basically mean removing state control from public education and allowing local districts, um, local groupings, uh, to decide public education taxes, expenditures, policies uh, for themselves. Okay, and that's about it. So at this point, usually the seminar, is, you know, you're supposed to talk about 30 minutes, roughly speaking, and then uh, we have some time for questions and discussion, debate, confrontation, brawling, <laughs> and eating your lunch, and all that kind of stuff. Mark, do you have anything there on how, I'm just curious, how Switzerland, since they asked how did they stack up on the uh, test score? Do you have any information on that? Ah, Lehman. Um, I think I remember seeing that. Thomas, do you know about education in Switzerland? Uh, my general impression is that it's that it's pretty good. Yeah, I would, I would think spending has better results there. But you know, but you know, yeah, that, yeah, that's that's the thing about Switzerland is that most of the functions of government in Switzerland um, are much more controlled at the local level. And, you know, they have those local governing units uh, that are very independent. As a matter of fact, they can decide, I think they can even decide to join other countries. You know, so if they didn't like what Switzerland was imposing on them, they could join France, although that might be a little dangerous too, um, or Germany or Italy or Austria or whatever. So in terms of the, the solutions that I was looking at in public education where the a big majority of our money is spent here in Alabama, they tend to do exactly the types of things that make the public sector maybe not perform efficiently or optimally, optimally or fairly or anything like that, but a whole lot better than when it is centrally controlled um, at the state level and then the federal level on top of that. You know, they're very de decentralized. They're, um, they have a lot of public input into their governmental decision-making process and their public resource allocation process. And so I would not be surprised that, that they, they're spending those greater resources. Of course, it's a fairly wealthy country, too. Um, the more economic growth, one of the things that I found in the literature is the more economic growth you have, um, the more education is both demanded and supplied. The wealthier you become, the more you want education for your children. And so a free market economy is very important for that. Um, to, you have more economic growth. You have people wanting more education. And in a free market economy, when you have opportunities, you also have, you know, from the student side of it, you have them thinking, well, there's all these opportunities out there. If I become highly educated, if I get um, some good degrees behind me, then I have a lot of opportunity and a lot of um, in the economy. So um, I don't know a lot of the specifics, but that's my general impression of what I have seen. Jeff. Uh, most of your from 1999. Uh, since that time, uh, at the federal level, in case you've seen uh, 
month will collapse and then the earnings will collapse. The first time in the year, uh, it's a, a real, very dramatic decline in the revenues collected by the federal government. And I know that to some extent it reflects in the state budgets. How has that affected Alabama relative to every state? Well, I do have figures up to 2002, and those figures indicate that state revenues of all sorts are growing pretty much along the same path that they were growing during the boom years. Um, the federal government's revenue structure is, of course, a little different than the states. We, re we re rely on sales tax, the income tax, property taxes, and of course in Alabama, lots of fees and, and excises and, and things of that nature. And um, <clears throat> there really hasn't been much slowdown in um, revenues in the state of Alabama. And I think my impression is, is that Alabama is somewhat unique compared to other states and different than the federal government. For example, we don't have, we don't um, get a lot of revenue from capital gains taxes and, and things of that nature um, compared to other states. We're separated from uh, Wall Street, so to speak. Uh, and we're also a resource-based economy. Uh, forestry is very important. Agricultural products are, is very important. Uh, you know, that's what Auburn is about, basically, is forestry, agriculture, all of those kind of things. And uh, as well as coal and oil and various other things. And those industries should be experiencing gains. So that if you're a forest owner and the price of wood is up, you should be getting more money. The state's going to be getting more money as a result of that. If you're growing cotton and the price of cotton is up, you're making more money. The state makes more money. That's one thing I, you know, it always distracts me about this this debate, do we have enough taxes? Well, the state of Alabama's taxes are almost all in percentage terms. So if our income grows, if the economy grows, if we have more people earning more money, the state gets a percentage of everything we make. They're kind of like the mafia. They get their percentage off of everything that we get. And, we're, and there's a lot of industries in Alabama which I would think based on looking at the cotton price, oil prices, coal prices, uh, forest product prices, which are double what they were a couple of years ago, that they should all be making more money and that the state, you know, is, should be having plenty of uh, increased flow uh, of revenues into their coffers. And I think there has been a couple of surprises where the uh, finance director in, in Montgomery has said, well, things aren't really as bad as we thought they were going to be. So, Marcus. How would you respond to someone who points to some counterexamples of uh, areas where there's more centralized control in education, but, but better results? Maybe in Japan or France. What would, you, what would you have as a kind of counter argument there? that I know absolutely nothing about the educational system of Japan <laughs> and France. Although I have heard that both okay, are good. You know, there's a cultural issue, just put it in more general terms. I mean, there are these nations that, that have more centralized systems, but they also perhaps have some better foundation. <clears throat> what would you, you know, say to this advocate of higher taxes and Alabama is going to become like Japan or something? Well, there's a lot of arguments that you could you could raise one of which I had have done, where you know more money has not resulted in improved performance, and some people would say it's resulted in poor performance. I'd also like to look at um, the French and Japanese systems. I mean, they may be nationally controlled, uh, but without a lot of the layers of control that we have in the United States. Um, we have the federal. Uh, layer, and we have the state layer, and the county, and the local district, um, and so we have multiple layers, and what I would like to see is um, not only elimination of those layers, but 
you know, the local control. And these national uh, programs uh, may not have as much regulation that filters down because, simply because they have to apply to the whole country, okay, so that they can't do all of the details of education at the national level um, precisely because they are controlling everything at the national level, and therefore they leave more room of operations at the local level. But that is just a guess. Um, you know, I, I can't say anything for France or Japan, but uh, my team back work is uh, in Tanzania, and uh, we've, we've had many discussions about the differences in the education systems. And Tanzania has a completely centrally controlled government education system, but there's only one level, the federal level. They set the standards. They have the, the national uh, test for all students is done at the same time. You know that on this day, at this hour, every student in the country is taking the same test with the same questions, and they're all graded at the, uh, at the capital by the same standard. And so one of the things they have going for them is that they, they have this standard meter stick. Mm -hmm. Is about the Bush plan? <laughs> um, and so, they, you know, but because they don't all have all the extra levels, and, and they don't have the money to put into the system. And he said that, that quite often they had um, bad teachers, because all the teachers are sent out from the central government. He said, but everybody knows what's going to be on the test. You know what you have to know. And so quite often they, they have to teach themselves. And it works. <laughs> Guido, Guido told me that uh, in France that most uh, most students actually attend private schools, and that to get into higher education in France is very competitive. So they have um, a very different system than in the United States, where I think he said the majority of students go to private schools, and the number of slots to get into the public universities. Um, is very small, so it's very competitive uh, to get in. In contrast to our system, where only a minority go to <clears throat> private schools, and there's basically, you know, plenty of spaces in higher education for virtually anybody who wants to go. Richard. Um, let me take, um, it's not just the level of government involved in education, but particularly in a state like Alabama, do you think that maybe the real problem is that the schools are essentially labor managed firms? Um, and the, nothing has changed in, in education without the approval of the Alabama Education Association. In fact, a very good change in the state government without their approval. And and so, even in countries where the firms were not state-owned, uh, the countries that did practice labor management didn't do too well. And uh, uh, I think that that I look at the that the educational hierarchy, and at times I think the whole purpose of education is to provide some employment in places like Auburn for educational faculties because what they need to be certified is higher and higher degrees in education. And, and so they come back here summer after summer to get uh, more relevant training so that they qualify for higher and higher pay. And our teachers, you know, on the basis of amount of years of education are amazingly confident. They know very little about what they they should be teaching. And I think that because they're uh, so anti-intellectual that uh, we have nonsense that goes on in our educational system. I mean, I guess it was George Will who said that the old three R's of education, reading, writing, and arithmetic, have been replaced by the modern three R's, what race, reproduction, and recycling. And, 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 and it, I mean, my daughter knows a lot about recycling. She's in the third grade. 
And I, I'm afraid that she knows a lot about reproduction too, although we don't talk about things like that. But how would you feel if we passed one law in this state and said, from this point on, uh, state-funded schools will not hire anyone with a degree in education. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they have their problems right there. I mean, that's, increased, that's increased government regulation in some sense, but I often think that that, that is the problem. I mean, the education, I'm sorry if I'm stepping on any toes here, but the education schools notoriously attract the weakest students. Um, and somehow we expect students who have never really been very interested or good at academics to create a curriculum and environment where, where that type of thing is, is emphasized and supplied. Um, well, I think I think it's um, I think it's a symptom of the problem. And I think what you said at the beginning was is more of the problem, and that is that state government is basically controlled by the teachers' union in the state of Alabama, and that's not surprising given the fact that there's this huge amount of resources in higher education, two-year schools, and K through 12 that sits there in Montgomery and waits to get divided up in various forms. I mean, it's the overwhelming majority of state resources. And, uh, and so you shouldn't be surprised that teachers and college professors and uh, two-year school people, you know, play an active role. And I think that that was probably the, the biggest eye-opener uh, experience that I received while working in Montgomery in the governor's office um, was exactly how well the teachers union controlled state government. I usually wasn't allowed out of my office very often, but a couple of times they brought me over to the legislature while it was in session. Uh, one time it was for, well, I was over there several times, but one time in particular it was for a committee meeting and another time was for an open session of the legislature. And, uh, the, the fellow from the uh, governor's office who was making sure I didn't get in any trouble pointed out in the committee meeting and in the legislature that Paul Hubbard was sitting, you know, he's sitting right down there. And Paul Hubbard is the union boss for the teachers union. And the committee chairman, you know, they would be proceeding along and they now should we call this question to order and he'd look over at Paul Hubbard and Hubbard would either nod yes or no and then they would proceed from there and so Paul Hubbard was basically directing you know this budget committee in one case and then the legislature in general with little nods of his head just like a little puppeteer and so you know so they get laws passed that require you know, greater degrees for greater salaries and, you know, and protect jobs uh, against competition from people who are good teachers but don't meet certain qualifications, don't have certain pieces of paper, uh, people who would be willing to work for less. You know, <laughs> you know that's a big, a big point is that um, there's a lot of labor out there that's available. You know, they, they talk about uh, you know, not having enough money for this type of teacher or that type of teacher. Um, a lot of schools don't even need those type of teachers. They might need just a part-time person uh, who comes in once a week or in the morning or whatever, but the union rules don't allow that kind of thing. They need full-time, fully paid, permanent, tenured uh, people in there that aren't really subject to controls, constraints, pressures, competition, review, and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's the union and the money that is the cause, and education uh, programs like we have um, are the symptom or the end result. I think Texas has made, made some steps in that, in that direction to eliminate the power of the teachers' union. I don't know that they made many. I know you don't need a teaching certificate. 
least for a few years or something like that. Maybe they probably get a provisional certification dodge. Mm -hmm. They'll give you a provisional certification that's good for, uh, I'm, I'm assuming here. They're never as strong as they are here in Alabama. For, for many years, we've had an option to. But they're competitive in some way to totally reject the strike for them. So it's free market, you know, a uh, future organization for them. I think in Texas, the exemption to get that preliminary status, they give you a long enough time so that if you did get the job, you had several years to take the courses on a part-time basis to get certified. Whereas in Alabama, they allow it, but they don't really permit you enough time to get those qualifications um, and of course, I mean, I, you would think that you get a provisional status, you go into the classroom, you teach, you you perform well, you wouldn't need any other sort of certification or any other sort of credential or degree or whatever. But um, all of those provisions in most states are required. It's just in Alabama, they're very strict, and they are also they just don't give you enough time. So school districts aren't really looking to hire people that way. They only use that for a stopgap measure. <clears throat> because of the uh, union control, pay is based, I think, entirely on the basis of, of uh, seniority and uh, educational attainment. And, uh, and that's, that's a standard uh, uh, union position. Uh, and I think it has you know, obvious, obvious effects. I mean, you get to have by like, getting um, advanced degrees in education, the being getting advanced degrees in education and doing a good job in the classroom is not that. And, you know, so probably people respond to incentives. Well, you know, I think that this issue that we're, we dealt with here today is really a, the most important issue in the state of Alabama as, as far as government is concerned. And I think that we have a great solution. I think that, you know, if we could really have uh, private schooling and eliminate taxes in the state of Alabama, that this could be um, an economic miracle um, of unprecedented proportions uh, given Alabama's resources. Uh, but another problem is people's ideology and people's thought processes in this state. Um, a fellow traveler of the Austrian School Investment Advisor, Jimmy Rogers, who's from the state of Alabama and went to Auburn and has come back and spoke at Auburn uh, several times, wrote an editorial uh, a couple of years ago where he suggested very simply, outlining a lot of the problems that we discussed in here, he said, well, one thing we could do that would immediately and dramatically have a, a, a tremendous impact on Alabama and its ability to uh, get foreign investment into the, into the state, uh, specifically German investment into the state, would be to eliminate high school football and mandate that everyone, and mandate that every student in the state of Alabama learn German. I'm assuming that other languages were possible, but he's he thought German was the one that everybody should learn. And of course, you know, everybody recognizes immediately that, well, if we did that, yeah, I mean, the students, if we got rid of all the extracurricular activities and started saying you must have a foreign language, that the students of Alabama would be, um, get much better results, uh, would be much more, and would be a tremendous draw. But uh, the majority of people that were surveyed said, no, we don't. That may work, but we don't want that kind of solution because football is too important. We also need to outlaw cartoon networking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid you end up with students who are illiterate in two languages. <laughs> <laughs> yes, John. Do you, you know the audience better than whether or not when you get your answer you'll have to go through the lab curve? But taking the lab curve is a gift and. Uh, Whenever I would be approached by these Alabama Rise folks and Republicans, all these advocates of big government, and they say that they want, you know, higher taxes, which, you know, is 
terrible in Alabama would be the more progressive tax system here in Alabama. And I would, you know, throw out the usual reply to that is the top 50% income owners, income earners in the state pay 96% of the taxes. How much more progressive do you want? And of course, then the Alabama Rise folks don't want to say that and put that in the other vote. Isn't that pretty progressive? Well, they knew it was going to be about math and women that they had in the first place. So, given the lack of her, here's a specific question to you. Can you make the argument, especially given the data that you've given, that taxes are too high simply in the sense that if you made the taxes more uniform and less restrictive, you know, less deleterious in whatever fashion, that you might actually see revenues increase? Not that I think the legislature really cares about revenue. They care about power. Well, they care about every dollar of revenue, believe me. Because it gives them power to... Manipulate folks like McGuffer. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a, I think that's a tough one. Um, it's a, it's a, it would be a tough sell. Uh, the one thing that you, you can note about, you know, this fairness issue in the income tax is that in Alabama, they set up the income tax during the Great Depression. It was meant to hit just the wealthy, uh, but they never indexed yeah. the tax code. If we index the tax code uh, to inflation over time, um, only about 15% of Alabamians will be paying the income tax. And um, just about everybody who's got a job. So you better go back and do your taxes, Joe. <laughs> uh, and we are, unfortunately, we are out of time, and we do close right at 1 o'clock, but we can... You know, you feel free to hang around and, and discuss this further, and we do need to let s probably a few people get back to jobs and and uh, classes and things like that. Uh, we will be meeting again next week on Thursday, and I hope to see everybody here. Bring a friend.